Okay, hello and welcome to our second webinar from the series Negotiating Digital Space in Culturally Significant Storytelling, which forms a cross-cultural and interdisciplinary webinar series co-curated by uh, Katie Graham and me, Pallavi Swaranjali, and organized by the Canadian Centre for Mindful Habitats in association with the Bachelor of Media Production and Design Program School of Journalism at Carleton University in Ottawa along with the Bachelor of Interior Design program, Algonquin College in Ottawa. This, this is a seven part webinar series and it is supported by a Shirk Connections grant. And it runs from June 16 to July 28, 2022. It explores the multifaceted concept of storytelling and how digital technology is expanding on the storytelling uh, toolkit. While digital tools bring new ways to tell stories and remove limitations of access, a multitude of ethical and technical issues arise, such as those of ownership, appropriation, inclusion, and dissemination. So in our seven sessions of the webinar series, these questions and others will be explored through conversations with invited speakers from diverse fields within academia and in industry. So join us as we explore how we negotiate digital space. As many of you may know, we had our first webinar titled Ownership of the Materiality of Stories, which discussed the ethical dilemmas on data ownership associated with digital documentation. It is available for viewing on Mindful Habitat's website and YouTube channel. And today we are very, very excited to welcome two very distinguished speakers, Brian Greenspan and Louis Pelletier in our session, which is titled The Omnipresence of Screens, Ideal Projections. So welcome, Brian and Louise. Um, and today, the session is going to be, it, it's a very promising session. I'm really excited. Um, and as we know that screens can distort and manipulate reality, but they can also increase engagement and understanding. The delivery and point of view uh, determine the outcome of these. So in our webinar today, uh, Louise Pelletier examines how different points of view negotiate the role of the image in a digital era, while Brian Greenspan explores the concept of narrative transportation through screens and visualization of ideal spaces. So I have Katie Graham with me here today, and I would invite Katie to uh, talk a little bit about our speakers and probably the format of our webinar today. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, so the way today will go is that each speaker, um, Brian and then Louise, will have 20 minutes to present. And then afterwards, we will uh, moderate a conversation and discussion. Uh, at any point, people in the audience are welcome to uh, put a question in the Q&A or use the chat to ask something or make a comment. And we will direct those questions in the Q&A time to the speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce both speakers at this point and then uh, stop sharing my screen to allow uh, Brian to, to share his screen and begin. Um, so our first speaker is Brian Greenspan. He is an associate professor in the Department of English, the doctoral program on cultural mediations and the master's program in human computer interaction at Carleton University. And he teaches in the MA specialization and BA minor in digital humanities. He is founding director of the Hyperlab, Carleton's premier digital humanities research facility and um, an executive member of the Society of, for Utopian Studies. His scholarship focuses on spatial storytelling and the utopian dimensions of new media, including e-literature and XR media. He invented the story track location, locative authoring system for spatial stories, mobile exhibits, and digital games, which has been used by artists, scholars, and students in um, Anchorage, Belfast, Charlottetown, um, Charlottetown, Copenhagen, Edinburgh, Montreal, Amasita, New York, and elsewhere. So thank you very much for being here, Brian. Um, and second, Louise uh, Pelletier. Um, she's trained as an architect and received her PhD in the history and theory of architecture from McGill University in 2000. 
Uh, she has been teaching at the UCAM School of Design in Montreal since 2006, where she is also director of the UCAM Design Center. She is the author of Architecture in Words, Theater, Language, and Sensuous Space of Architecture, and co-author of Architectural Representation and the Perspective Hinge and um, theatrical space as a model for architecture. She is also the author of Downfall, The Architecture of Excess, a novel that reflects on issues of contemporary architectural practice. So thank you very much, Louise, for being here. Um, so at this moment, I'm going to pass over the share screen function to Brian, who will take over and will begin. Thank you, Katie, for that introduction and to you and Pallavi for inviting me here to this exciting series. It's really a privilege to be part of it. Um, I'll try to share this now. And this should be a go. Okay, I think that works. All right, um, so I, I wanna tell you about some of the projects that we've been working on at Carleton's Hyperlab involving new approaches to storytelling with site-specific augmented reality media. For a while now, I've been really interested in how stories transport us to other worlds, whether they're the past worlds described in historical novels or fantastic worlds that never were, were like this elf village, or the future worlds of science fiction or utopian narratives, which is my primary scholarly interest. Narrative transportation is the cognitive and emotional process by which readers become absorbed into fictional worlds. Transportation occurs when the reader mentally shifts their sense of location from the real world to the world of the story, which is why we sometimes think of reading as an act of escapism. Now, these worlds may be fictional, but the phenomenon of being transported to them is real. We all know what it's like to become lost in a book or a movie. Cognitive psychologists and narratologists have shown that transportation operates through a complex blend of effects that depend on a reader's attention to the story, their awareness or lack of awareness of their actual real world surroundings, their identification with characters in the story and the resulting affect or emotion that they experience. But narrative transportation is usually explained through analogy to physical travel. And experiments have shown that in order to be transported to a fictional world, to be truly immersed in it, a reader first has to enter its fictional space time and leave the real world behind. Which paradoxically is why narratives that transport us tend to be more convincing. There's empirical evidence that as we abandon our connection to the real world, we're more likely to accept what the story tells us. And if you're imagining yourself sitting in this comfy chair, reading about a world of queens and knights, then you're already doubly transported, which also makes you more inclined to believe me, since studies also show that transporting an audience can help to convince and persuade them. We tend to empathize more with a story's characters and their values when we're immersed in their world which might explain how our capacity to be transported first evolved, assuming that empathy and social cohesion convey a survival advantage. But this capacity is also tied to historical developments in media and technology. And I'm not talking about virtual reality headsets, but earlier technologies of mobility, such as the steam engine, the rise of railroads and the po popularity of long cross-country journeys in the 1800s sparked a demand for fat triple-decker novels to pass the time while traveling. Uh, it's as though we're so eager to be somewhere else that we can't even wait to reach our destination. And today people are reading more screens than printed pages, I think it's safe to say. Uh, whether it's eBooks, emails, social media, or text messages, reading interfaces that accompany us wherever we go. The ubiquity and portability of mobile screens allows us to read everywhere all of the time. At the same time, mobile screens tend to reward continuously distracted attention, not deep immersion. Barring long train or air journeys, the increased mobility of reading interfaces offers fewer opportunities for deep sustained reading which hinders our transportation to fictional worlds. 
it doesn't help matters that our devices always know exactly where we are in the real world. Instead of helping us to get lost in other worlds, geolocative apps like Uber or Google Maps guide us to our favorite coffee shop or gas station with impressive precision, keeping us tied to the real world, which is framed as the space of commerce, not the space of dreams. All of which got me wondering, how can we make mobile devices less distracting and more immersive? Can we combine locative wayfinding, the real world knowledge that you are here now, with the sense that you are now here in another unreal world? How can we use the screens we carry with us while navigating the real world to transport us into more inviting and ideal worlds while also being attentive to our actual lived spatial environment. And this was the inspiration behind StoryTrek, a locative authoring system for site-specific augmented reality storytelling, which I developed with a team at the Hyperlab. StoryTrek allows authors to create spatial stories that respond in real time to the user's physical movement through the world and ever-changing geospatial context. You navigate our system by simply walking through an urban or natural environment with a mobile device in hand as the story tags along, changing its course depending on your location, route, and style of navigation. For instance, we've built site-specific locative installations that tell the story of important cultural spaces. Working with uh, Canadian Heritage and a team of archivists and architects at Carleton, we created an open air museum that tells the history of the construction of Ottawa's Rideau Canal in situ. It includes a game as well, so kids can experience what it was like to be an immigrant worker building the canal. They go around collecting virtual pickaxes and supplies while avoiding malaria and dynamite explosions. It's great fun, and it's all based in historical fact and archival uh, imagery. But most of our stories are more imaginative and original. Uh, this was the very first story track, Crisis 22, written by Montreal artist Pippin Barr. Barr's surreal love story documents the inner turmoil and regrets of a solitary narrator as he wanders through a fictional landscape that changes depending on where you go and how you get there. Move forward and you read a present tense story about walking toward a rendezvous. Turning around and backtracking will fill in the backstory. Turn away from a straight path and the narrative digresses into side stories. Pause and the system knows that you're lingering and triggers an interior monologue, which is what you see here in parentheses. Wherever you decide to go, you're presented with a coherent but dynamically changing story cued to your location and movement. Melanie Green and Timothy Brock have argued that transportation into the world of a story requires a well-made structured narrative plot, which is why unlike most locative apps, which are just basically points of interest on the map, um, StoryTrek offers more. StoryTreks are continuous, complex narratives with chapters, levels, and forking paths. They're vectors that rely on the reader's transportation through the real world to transport them into the fictional world. And this double transportation encourages readers to occupy the space around them differently by drawing connections between the story world and the real world. Our users have run away from invisible threats or playfully identified other pedestrians they encounter in the street with characters in the story, sometimes even approaching them, which raises in interesting ethical issues. One reader even dipped her feet in a river that is at once fictional and real. Our users have one foot in the story and one foot in the real world, which I would argue is an even more powerful experience than being fully immersed in the story. It's more powerful than VR. 
because it forces you to think about how the story world reflects the real world around you and how it differs. It reminds you that your own world could be different, that another world is possible. And this critical awareness that the world could always be better is evidenced in Isolation U, a game created by three brilliant students in the Hyperlab. In this story trek, you play a freshman newly arrived at Carleton who wants to make friends and fit in. And as you explore our actual campus with your mobile screen in hand, you're bombarded by fictional ads for everything from food and clothing to music and nightclubs. You also hear rumors of a conformity virus that spreads through texts and emails, turning students into zombies who all want to buy exactly the same products from campus vendors. The story cleverly pushes back against the corporatization of higher education and the growing tendency to treat students as customers and knowledge as a commodity. Now, these stories of ours never reached a large audience. Locative storytelling remains a niche medium for indie authors and artists, despite that location-based apps have become an everyday technology. To gain a larger audience, we had to move off campus and into the wider world, where we could take some lessons from popular fictional genres, a journey that took us all the way to Edinburgh. We're working with colleagues from Queen's University Belfast and Orion Books, we tested Story Trek's ability to tell a coherent linear story in a popular genre by adapting a best-selling detective novel for mobile delivery. Ian Rankin's Set in Darkness is the 11th book in the world-famous Inspector Rebus series, which has already been adapted uh, for radio and television by the BBC. Our version allows readers to literally follow the story through the misty lanes of Edinburgh, like a sleuth tailing a suspect. Adapting Rankin's deceptively complex novel for a mobile screen was a real challenge. Uh, locative augmented reality doesn't readily lend itself to telling long stories with well-made linear plots. Again, it's more about points of interest. You are here now, not where you've been and where you're going. Uh, but we had to be true to the story and make sure it got told in the right order without any missed cues or spoilers. All the while acknowledging that our users would be touring around the city freely and could leave the set story path at any time. It helps that Set in Darkness is a novel of place. The story foregrounds the old Gothic buildings that sit alongside new construction projects driven by the recent local boom in urban renewal and development. So many building sites, as the villain points out, with lots of good deep holes in which to bury bodies and secrets. It also helps that the novel relies on architectural landmarks to ground local history in contemporary issues like Scottish nationalism, class politics, and gentrification. For instance, arriving at Grass Market in the Old Town triggers a present day photo of the street along with a passage from the audiobook observing that they used to hold executions here and that it was a haven for the destitute right up until the 1970s when developers transformed it into a cute tourist spot, which encourages our users, many of whom are tourists, to reflect on their own complicity in the city's ongoing gentrification. With our trek, you can't help but notice how much the city's changed even in the two decades since this novel was originally published. These changes to your material environment accentuate the story's gothic aesthetic of decay, even as it adds access barriers. With so much ongoing construction, the day will come when some of the story's main sites of interest no longer exist, at which point our truck will become unreadable itself a victim of the creative destructions of urban renewal. Having learned some lessons about adapting popular fiction uh, for, for mobile delivery, we journeyed on to Southern Spain, the setting of Ernest Hemingway's last unfinished story, The Dangerous Summer, written in 1960. And in this travel narrative, Hemingway recalls his final visit to Andalusia decades earlier 
culminating in his account of a competitive bullfight in Malaga, which, which contest has been seen as an allegory of the Spanish Civil War or as an account of Hemingway's struggle with his literary rivals and his own aging self-image. We spent January of 2020 retracing the author's steps, creating a trek that lets you play the part of a mature Hemingway as he strolls through the tiled streets and ancient parks, desperate to connect to his youthful memories of the city, all the while evading a, no a nosy cub reporter, that's you, who's chasing Hem Hemingway through Malaga in hopes of landing an interview with the famous author. It was also an experiment in guerrilla dissemination strategies to help build our audience. We brought along these magnetic biodegradable 3D printed icons, which are an extruded image of Hemingway donning bull's horns uh, and placed them in discrete locations around the streets of Malaga, Granada and Madrid on the back of a hydro box, the underside of a tapas bar or the wall of the historic farmer's market. Each icon is geo-referenced and on the reverse holds a QR code in relief. Snap a picture and it links to a website with instructions for accessing the mobile story. And it worked. People found our icons, uh, sometimes multiple times for the same icon, and they registered on our site for an access code to the story. That was in early 2020, right before Spain went into lockdown closing the streets to pedestrians and making our story unreadable. Meanwhile, Edinburgh's lockdown forced us to suspend the launch of our Set in Darkness adaptation. This experience has taught us some important lessons about how physical and digital spaces are connected. These projects all invite users to engage in new forms of mobile embodied public storytelling at a moment in history that discourages just such behaviors. With real fatalities lurking in every corner and governments tracking the movements of their populations, our stories about zombie viruses, blood sports, neglected bodies, and clandestine surveillance suddenly appeared distasteful. It brought home that the very same places can hold different meanings in different times and that the spaces we occupy as embodied individuals are always connected to global contexts and events. That's also the lesson of my final example this morning, MOVE, a story trek created by Ottawa-based artist and educator, Zan Woods. It was inspired by Duncan Campbell Scott, the famous Canadian Confederation poet, and infamous architect of the residential school system for Indigenous children. The installation begins when you receive a simulated call on your mobile, inviting you to meet a friend downtown for coffee. As you set out to find your friend, your movements trigger jarring alarms and distorted audio cues that literally stop you in your tracks, discouraging any bodily movement at all. In a way, it's an inversion of those strategies that commercial apps and websites use to nudge consumer behavior in particular directions so that we buy specific products. As the author explains, Move offers its users a restrictive experience where our knowledge, movement, and identity are radically limited, altered, and challenged by an embodied experience of immobility, unquote. The story forces critical reflection on the real world barriers to both actual and narrative transportation, barriers that aren't always so easily left behind. And this is where our stories, I feel, can achieve what conventional printed narratives can't. By not only foregrounding the fact that access and mobility have always been unevenly distributed, but also making that a part of the reader's lived embodied sensory experience. What better medium to express our newly heightened awareness of our urban surrounds now replete with actual viral hotspots? 
The atmosphere of paranoia that hovers over public spaces still only intensifies our mobile version of Ian Rankin's police procedural and resonates more deeply with the story of an aging Hemingway always looking over his shoulder. Augmented reality storytelling allows users to be transported to other worlds while remaining ever mindful of this one, allowing us to find the ideal in the everyday. It reminds us that we can't take our lived environments for granted and that we'll only ever reach a better world by keeping one foot in this world. And these are some of the amazing students and scholars who have helped to realize these various projects. So thanks very much for listening. I look forward to hearing what everyone thinks. Thank you very much, Brian. I have many questions and thoughts, but I'm gonna hold off and wait. Um, and I'm going to pass over uh, the, the share the screen function to Louise. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Katie and Pallavi, for, for the invitation. Let me see if I can share my screen. So you see everything? Good. Um, so yes, thank you so much uh, to both of you for, for this very kind invitation. And, and thank you, Brian, for this fascinating presentation. Uh, I, I also have... Uh, Many, uh, many questions, but mostly the desire to experiment some of the uh, some of these uh, immersive uh, narrative that you spoke about. Uh, very fascinating. Um, the when uh, when Katie and Palavi first invited me uh, to uh, give a talk as part of this um, lecture series. Um, there were many questions that were uh, put forward uh, as potential um, uh, bases of discussion, and, and one in particular, um, they, they ask, uh, can the digital create a parallel space for storytelling, and what impact does it have on the role of the author, narrator and reader, storyteller, story keeper? Um, and to me, this is a very fundamental question, especially in uh, the contemporary uh, context. Um, and, um, and in order to uh, attempt even a fragmentary answer to this complex question, um, I, I will start from the premise that uh, exhibition curating uh, is a form of storytelling. Um, as Katie mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm currently the director of the Design Center, which is a, a gallery, um, design and architecture gallery in Montreal. And um, we present a number of exhibition uh, projects related to, to design and architecture. And, and um, I'd like to tell you more specifically about one project uh, in, in particular. Uh, an exhibition we did uh, last spring, a year ago, uh, called uh, Ecran Total, which literally means total screen, um, which was conceived as some kind of laboratory that allowed for various experimentation to breach this gap between the analog and, and the digital. Um, the exhibition uh, developed over a number of years, uh, happened to... Uh, be scheduled for a moment uh, we hadn't ex expected, you know, the, the lockdown of uh, the pandemic. Um, but basically the, the, um, the objective of this exhibition was to bring together a series of um, 35 millimeter photographs from, from the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard, uh, in conversation with a number of contemporary artists that excavate the digital realm to bring to life uh, our current state of, uh, of being. So uh, before I go into it um, in more detail, to me it's, it's important to, um, to mention and, and mostly to acknowledge the extraordinary work of the curatorial team uh, that worked on this project, um, because it's important to know that producing an exhibition is always a teamwork. It involves a lot of people, uh, my own 
uh, the whole team uh, at the design center, but, but more specifically, um, I worked with a team of wonderful curator, um, Katharina Nemeyer, Magali Hull, uh, Amandine Alessandra and Carole Lévesque, together with uh, Marine Baudrillard, uh, the, the widow of uh, Jean Baudrillard. So um, the, the exhibition raised a number of questions uh, about, about storytelling. Um, and uh, as uh, Brian uh, brilliantly introduced, um, telling a story raises uh, many issues, um, issues of plot, uh, issues uh, of, uh, of structure. Uh, in fact, uh, many literary theorists would tell you that uh, there are only about seven basic plots uh, to the story we tell uh, and we have told in the whole history of literature. Um, there are variation, of course, and subcategories, happy ending, unhappy ending, uh, open endings. Um, other will tell you that it's all about uh, the characterization, how one identifies to the characters, uh, is drawn into the stories, uh, is either entertained by the events or profoundly transformed by them. And, and of course, uh, the, the question of the the projection in this fictional space, which I found very fascinating uh, in, in Brian's presentation. But beyond um, all these questions uh, about you know, some formalization of storytelling uh, is the effectiveness in which, with which the author will convey seemingly authentic emotions. And that's where storytelling for me has the potential to transform, transcend, its medium to convey a coherent plot. The main plot uh, or story I intend to, to tell you today um, is that during the pandemic, the computer screen became the all powerful point of view uh, that mediated our understanding of the situation and has affected the manner in which we interact with one another and by extension, uh, the way we construct our stories. So um, in, in 1976, uh, Baudrillard famously said that there's no separation any longer, no empty space, no absence. Um, you enter the screen and the visual image unhindered. Um, you enter your life as you would walk onto a, street, a screen. You slip on your own life like a data suit. Um, as some of you may know, uh, Baudrillard uh, wrote extensively on uh, the, the contemporary condition, uh, you know, from, from the 1980s, 90s. And, but already a few decades ago, he predicted this omnipresence of screens that we face today in our everyday lives. Uh, his diagnosis already prefigured this culture of hyper-reality where the screen is the interface for virality, simulation, surveillance, and implosion. So uh, the exhibition Total Screen uh, brought together the work of uh, the French philosopher in conversation with um, some really great artists, uh, from all over the world, from uh, Adam Basenta, Mishka Ener, uh, Vazem Bati, and Penelope Umbrico, uh, but also some emerging artists like Charlie Doyon, Kim Enns, and uh, Wang Ji. Um, I wish I could tell you about uh, all these uh, very intriguing projects, uh, but uh, given the limited time, uh, I've chosen to, to focus my talk today on um, three of these projects that uh, address uh, three distinct point of view uh, on the contemporary image. So um, first, uh, the unseen presence in, in the work of Penelope Umbrico, 
the emotional projection in the work of Mishka Ener and Vazembati, and the third one uh, will address the objective gaze of technology uh, in the work of Adam Besenta. So, um, to begin with, um, uh, I'll tell you a few things about uh, the work of uh, Penelope Umbrico, uh, an, an amazing uh, American photographer I greatly admire. Um, in her work, she raises some fundamental questions about the role of the author um, as, as photographer. And um, in many of her, uh, of her work, uh, she replaces the role of the author by that of the narrator. Um, and I'll give you an example in a moment. Um, uh, her work also addresses the wider concern about the very manner in which we relate uh, to screens in general, uh, how we tend to forget about the material object uh, and look through it and focus on a space that exists only in the virtual otherness. Um, of the, the space uh, beyond, we, uh, we forget the, the material object. You know, I I'm speaking to you in front of this very slick uh, iMac uh, that bleeds to the edge and, and the whole objective is to make this, the screen disappear uh, so that you get immersed in, uh, in whatever is projected onto the screen. Um, what I find interesting in, in, Umbrico, in Umbrico's work is that she makes you aware uh, of the screen itself and, and um, her whole objective uh, is to uh, raise your awareness uh, of this uh, seemingly uh, objective point of view. So um, one of the work that uh, she uh, she produced um, more than a decade ago um, is clearly very clearly illustrates uh, this uh, fundamental aspect of her work, which explores the role of images in today's digitalized culture by appropriating and reproducing pictures she found uh, on the internet on platforms such as Flickr and Craigslist. Uh, she collects a, very, a variety of, um, of images following simple, apparently simple criterion, and then manipulates them to construct larger images or installation. Uh, in one instance, for example, she collected a whole series of um, pictures of uh, TVs for sale on Craigslist uh, that reveal not only the object for sale, but also uh, the reflection of the person taking the photograph. And, and, and of course, uh, that's the kind of detail uh, we don't pay attention to. Uh, but if you look at uh, the, the screen and uh, uh, if you look at some of the images, um, the screen itself uh, kind of recedes into the background and you start to discover um, this uh, very intimate world uh, projected onto the surface uh, of the screen. And, and this is precisely the kind of uh, detail and, and uh, the kind of question that her work raises, this materiality of the screen itself uh, and, and what, what it reveals and what it hides in order for us to, to inhabit uh, the virtual uh, world presented uh, uh, on, on the screen itself. So um, the curator of the exhibition, Total Screen, said about her work, by reframing pictures on the internet as a collective archive of human lives and habits, her work offers a deep commentary on the, on the banality of consumer culture. Umbrico's work through the use of appropriation creates a unique breed, bridge between personal and collective expression. The piece that she presented uh, at the Design Center last year was developed as part of a series called Broken Screen Out of Order uh, series, a work 
that focuses again on the materiality of the screen itself, uh, but more specifically on the error signal uh, that one gets uh, when the screen itself is broken. So again, uh, collecting the images of these error signals um, on uh, various uh, websites, uh, she produced a multimedia installation of dismembered layers of uh, liquid uh, crystal display, LSD screen, LCD screens, suspended as if at a standstill in the midst of an explosion. So um, I'll show you um, one very tiny uh, video that shows the, uh, the, spa the, the, the reconstruction of these error messages um, that she collected and then combined into uh, a video, uh, an hour long video that was in a loop, uh, presented in the exhibition um, Beyond, behind um, a, a dismembered uh, LCD screen um, that uh, filtered uh, our perception, our vision uh, of, the screen, of the screen. And again, uh, making us aware of this materiality uh, of the screen itself. So, um, uh, the, the other project uh, that was presented in the exhibition uh, was called Energy Ghosts by Mishka Ener and Vasim Bari. And like Penelope Ombrico, these two artists uh, make use of found images uh, on the internet. Um, again, using uh, various databases, but uh, in their case, their objective uh, is quite different. Uh, they dig into these digital archives to find uh, terrifying moments of natural disaster recorded by surveillance systems, uh, live webcam, uh, or uh, witnesses uh, filming the events on their, uh, on their phone. So uh, as archaeologists of the digital, uh, the, the normally dispassionate eye of the surveillance camera becomes this raw material uh, from which they reconstruct a, a new reality. And by juxtaposing uh, these momentous events that trigger powerful emotions, they subvert uh, the subjective gaze uh, of the camera. So in this case, uh, the video has sound, uh, and I hope uh, you can hear it. Um, so they documented, uh, as I said, they collected these, uh, these images that were framed uh, in, a, in a circular frame to uh, emphasize the connection with the eye uh, of the camera. And on top of it, they superimpose um, these very subtle uh, graphics that interact with the videos oh my they God. collected. Did you see that? And so the video um, lasted again uh, okay, a few hours and, oh and, God, and in the exhibition, one was immersed in this constant sequence of images of, of natural disaster. Um, uh, and uh, one could feel uh, very um, involved or very moved in, in many cases by uh, the, the tragedy that, uh, that the, the, the camera uh, recorded. So, um, the, the third and final project that uh, I want to show you is called All We Ever Need is One Another Trio. Um, and uh, this is the only work in the exhibition that wasn't produced specifically for uh, the exhibition, but was uh, an adaptation of, of an existing work by Adam Vacenta. So he's a multimedia uh, artist, um, and, and in this installation, um, he uh, generates, the, the installation itself generates uh, autonomously um, some art piece. So it's an art-making machine independent from human intervention, which 
raises, of course, the question of what happens uh, if the human presence is completely evacuated from the equation of art production, which is a very uh, challenging um, uh, and thought-provoking uh, question. So um, Basanta is an artist, composer, performer of experimental music, uh, born in Tel Aviv. Uh, and his work also investigates the objective gaze of technology. Uh, but in this case, um, he challenged their objectivity by placing them, uh, placing technology in unconventional, even absurd relationship uh, in, one in, uh, in relation to one another. So in this work in particular, um, he plays uh, three scanners that you can see in, in the back there, um, placed vertically that face uh, one another. Uh, and uh, three scanner that basically um, mutually uh, self scanned um, and, and this self scanning generated um, abstract images uh, that were sent to um, a series of computers that would compare the result to existing uh, art pieces. And when the approximation reached above 82%, um, the product was sent to a printer. So, uh, and, and that's what you see in, in the foreground, the printer uh, basically producing art pieces. Um, uh, and and uh, so through this work, the center questions the creative role uh, of the author and offers a cost, caustic comment on the reality of contemporary art. So uh, again, a little clip that shows you uh, the, the piece in action, like you see the, the three scanner and on top of it, he placed this flashing image that interferes with the scanning uh, process. So each scan was sent to one of the three computers. Um, the, the image that was generated was then compared to a, a database of existing art pieces. And it's quite interesting because the database included some of Umbrico's uh, pieces. So there was an interesting dialogue uh, with her piece on the other side uh, of the exhibition. Uh, and then um, the, the, the pieces were, were then sent uh, to the printer. So what was the general story being told in the exhibition, you may ask? Well, it's interesting to go back to the etymology uh, of the word screen, um, which basically uh, means to block wave and radiation or to filter what goes through. And to some extent, all the works presented in the exhibition offered this kind of resistance uh, to take the images at face value. Similarly, in the exhibition, we experimented with this back and forth between uh, the, the digital image and the real presence, um, questioning the status of the screen as a mediating tool. So as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, the exhibition happened uh, a year ago, halfway through the two years uh, pandemic. Uh, that we've experienced. And um, right in the middle, to, middle of a lockdown in Montreal, um, and, um, and until about a week and a half, two weeks before the opening, uh, we didn't even know if um, the public would be allowed in the exhibition room because everything was closed, as you may remember. Uh, so the whole exhibition became um, a kind of laboratory, as I, as I mentioned, because we uh, experimented with different forms of uh, mediation precisely to uh, respond uh, to the condition that we experienced at that point. So um, in the end, uh, about uh, 10 days before the opening, we were told that we would be allowed to uh, let the public in, uh, in uh, 
only a few people at the time, but still uh, it was quite a victory for us. So uh, one of the mediation, of course, uh, was um, the exhibits themselves. So we could enter the exhibition and see the actual art pieces. Uh, but, uh, but we had done a whole work uh, beforehand uh, trying to um, adjust or, or react to the situation. And in fact, um, the, the second form of mediation was this series of videos uh, I've been showing you. Uh, and these videos were presented um, in a form of hyper-reality, again, uh, responding to Baudrillard's uh, theory about the image. Uh, so these videos uh, were conceived as an idealized view uh, of the works on, uh, on a white background. Uh, and if I go back to the previous image, you can see that in, in the exhibition room itself, uh, the pieces were presented against a black background. So there was this, this contrast uh, that we wanted to emphasize for this, um, this hyper reality uh, of, uh, of the art pieces. And those videos uh, were presented um, uh, to be seen from the outside because uh, again, we, uh, we assume that uh, very few people would be able to enter the exhibition room. So the, the, the gallery became some kind of black box projecting outwards. Um, and, uh, and so the, exhibit, the exhibited pieces revealed in such a way, uh, exacerbated their absent presence by proxy uh, in a way. Uh, the third form of mediation was a website created specifically for the exhibition that offered um, distinct entry uh, into the works. Uh, and by the very nature of the, 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 the importance given to the digital in this exhibition uh, allowed us, allowed the exhibition to be included in the virtual pavilion of the Venice Biennale, uh, Architecture Biennale last uh, year, which paradoxically uh, gave the project uh, an exposure we never anticipated. So in the end, uh, the whole dilemma we faced turned out to be uh, quite a positive experience uh, in the end. So sorry, I, I think I went a little over time. <laughs> no, thank you, Louis and Brian. I think both presentations were very fascinating and we were uh, not looking at the time it was so fascinating time just went by um, so thank you both for very very uh, enlightening presentations and lots of questions that come to everyone's mind I'm pretty sure uh, I've been taking notes but I would like to invite both of you to talk about uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Louise and uh, about some comments about Brian's presentations, and then we can go to Brian uh, about comments for Louis's presentation. And what were some thoughts that were crossing your mind? Um, I, I must say, I, I found uh, Brian's work uh, very fascinating. And uh, I, um, I wish you know, I could experience some of them. Uh, there, there's a, there's a whole tradition uh, ever since the situationist to play uh, with uh, this interaction between uh, between an idea we have of a place and the place itself, um, and um, and um, I mean. It's, uh, I don't know if it's a, if it's a question, uh, but um, uh, the, uh, in, in your experimentation, uh, I was curious to know uh, how you document the experience of the, the viewers or the, the people experimenting, uh, experiencing, I should say, uh, your your storytelling, uh, you seem to be documenting uh, their their path or uh, how they go, uh, or is there some interaction, some feedback uh, you get from from people who uh, 
who go through the experience of experiencing the, the narratives? Yeah, yeah. so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question, Louise, um, because it was one that we struggled with over the years as we were developing the system. Uh, how do we know if it's working? How do we know how to improve it? Um, and so the, I guess the sort of dirty response, the, the, the scary response is that the system is built over Google Maps and it leverages some of the surveillance capabilities of Google. We're very conscious of this. And it's one of the reasons I think why so many of the tracks that we've built have surveillance built in as a theme. But our system does actually have the capacity to track to some extent at a, at a fairly high level um, where users, particular users go, uh, how long they spend there and how far they get in a particular narrative. Um, the, we can look at the, at the GPS data that we receive in more fine detail too, but we usually don't because it's, it's, um, it's difficult. Really though, the best feedback that we've had is when we go along with um, test users, when we accompany them uh, on a track through, uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's a good idea anyway to have someone along with you because you, you do tend to get immersed and transported at various points into the story. And it's easy to walk in, you know, into an open manhole or in, step in front of a bus. So we always have disclaimers that, you know, please work in groups and have somebody spotting for you if you're in an, if you're in an urban environment. But we also learn a lot because um, what happens is we get, you know, verbal feedback from people. We, we figure out when they're stuck, when they're confused, when they're overjoyed or excited, when they move faster or slower. And we can document all of this and take notes. And this is one of the ways that we've, we've got some really valuable feedback over, over what's working. Um, I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact too, that because we're there and the users know we're there, they at times tend to um, perform for us. When Celine dipped her foot in the river in that early test, for instance, um, she, she knew what she was doing. She was playing with the story a bit. Uh, the locative apps were still fairly new then. So to some extent she was testing the limits of the system technically, but to another extent she was having fun. She was performing. It was an embodied performance. And you know, I thought, well, maybe, maybe if we weren't here, they wouldn't perform quite that way. But I don't think that's true because I think that what happens very quickly when you're using one of these tracks, if you're on a story track, you realize that you are performing in public. Other people notice that you're navigating space differently. You're not, you're not moving the way they are. You're not uh, directed towards the same goal. And people tend to look at you curiously. Sometimes they smile or laugh. They try to figure out what's going on. Um, so you're already, in a sense, aware, you have to be aware that you're performing, that you're set apart from the crowd. And I've always been really interested in that and how, although this is reading is typically thought of as a solitary medium, unlike, say, drama, uh, nevertheless, this reading this way does generate an audience. And I'm always curious about how that works, that dynamic works as the individual user of a story track in relation to the people around them as an unwitting audience. And again, there are ethical considerations here, but it's also, it's also a pretty, I think one of the reasons why a lot of our stories end up having to um, virtually put a kind of a, a mob presence in them, a crowd presence. You know, sometimes they emerge as zombie hordes or you know, that are chasing you, but um, crowds seem to crop up a lot in when our authors create these stories. That was a long-winded answer, I know, but, but <laughs> story. Yeah. No, but it, it's very interesting. Um, uh, the the when one reads a story or one inhabits the world of the story, um, the the reader becomes active in a way you know because the author can only do so much you put the, the story out there but in the end uh i think in a in a good story the the reader becomes an active participant um even if you stay in a chair and you don't move just by uh immersing yourself into the work uh you you become um the co-creator in a way and, uh, and I wonder if it's something that uh, you explore in, in your work. Uh, is there a way to, uh, 
you know, you, you talk you talk about a story where depending on how you move, the story takes a different path. And uh, could the participant also input their observation or uh, interact with the story? Is that something that you ever played with? So it's it's sort of desiderata. We, we've thought about a lot of features we'd like to add. We're constantly adding features to the system. And one of them is the ability for an individual user, end user, to become a co-author, to input data or start writing in the story, as you say, and turn it into what we sometimes call a constructive hypertext. Uh, and, and this is you know one of the longstanding debates in hypertext and hypermedia theory the extent to which someone who is uh, reading, say, a screen-based, a web-based, um, or um, uh, uh, I, I'll say a screen-based hypertext that, that allows you to choose your own adventure, the extent to which simply click, choosing which links to click and which uh, screens or Lexia to read next constitutes an active co-creation of the story. That's a, that's a big debate. I, I think it is. We, we see different kinds of co-creation, though, even without allowing our users yet the ability to write into um, the story, they do anyway, um, because they're constantly drawing connections between the real world around them that they're moving through and the story they're reading about. And this is sort of natural, I think. I mean, there's a there's a, a theory by Marie-Laure Ryan of the principle of minimal departure, she calls it. And this theory is that when we read a book, the reason that we can read a story and get immersed in the story world is because we assume that the world of the story and the characters is not that far different from our own. So if I start telling you about a, a story set in, in, in Montreal, you're going to assume it's the Montreal that, that exists in your own real world and not a Montreal on another planet. You're going to assume that the grass is green and the sky is blue most of the time and that they have gravity. I don't have to tell you those things. Unless I say it's a science fiction narrative and I say the sky was, was full of smog, there were no stars then you would know, oh, it's a dystopian narrative and it departs from the real world. But unless I explicitly say that, you're going to draw connections, you're going to draw information about the story world from your own experience of the real world. What we witness is that our users are constantly drawing on things they see around them in their environment and putting them into the story and using that to flesh out the story. And sometimes it creates these really wild effects um, one of the stories, for instance, was set on uh, on the bike path along the canal. And, you know, at one point a user was reading and it said a, a cyclist passes you on the canal at, at the very moment that a bike passed them. Now, it was predictable that this would happen. The author was counting on it. But it's still for that user created this really uncanny feeling that the system knew exactly what was around them and where they were and was and was watching them. So it's this weird involution where you're reading, watching the characters in the story, but maybe the narrator is watching you as well. This mise on a beam, as it were. Mm -hmm. Very good. If I may, just I, I have my my last my last question is more technical, <laughs> from a professional to another. Uh, you said that the the story set in Edinburgh couldn't happen because of the lockdown, but isn't the whole system ideal for exploring the city by yourself uh, without having to enter into a museum? And I wonder why uh, it couldn't happen in the end. Or... Well, yeah, it, it could. I was talking specifically about our user tests that would have required, for instance, my colleague to fly from Belfast and um, uh, uh, Andrew Pepper from Queen's U Belfast, who is, is fantastic, and, and to and to help administer some of the tests. Um, so it interrupted that last sort of final user testing, which we've only just resumed a couple of weeks ago, in fact. But um, the, the, what we, we, we also offered was the system has a remote viewing option. So even if you're not in Edinburgh, you can write from Montreal or Ottawa, you can, or anywhere, you can just use the web-based version and have a simulated experience of what you would, what you might, experience if you're actually there. It's obviously not the same as really being there, but that in itself is kind of an interesting contrast. Very good, thank you. On that note, I also was, when I'm listening to your conversation and I'm picking up three words, reality, fiction, and virtuality, and is there 
many times we use fictional fiction and the virtual interchangeably uh, but I, I feel there's some kind of um, a dissolution between those two terms and uh, don't know if you would like to con comment on that there's just in continuation to that is when you're talking about the real and the fake or the fictional um, and, and awareness, I am really interested in that awareness. How much do we want people to be aware? Because, you know, when, when, whenever you're trying to create a virtual, um, you want to really make that distinction between reality and the fake disappear. But is there a need for that? Or should there be an awareness? What are your thoughts on um, that aspect? And it, it happened in both of your um, projects that you've described. So uh, the idea of reality or materiality that um, Louis, you were talking about and Brian, this idea of like touching the water, but you know, you're half here and half there. Um, how, what would you like to comment uh, on that aspect? You're asking Brian or oh, both sure. of you? <laughs> yeah, sure. I can, I can, I can take a stab. This is a great question. It's complex. Um, so, di different philosophers may differ <laughs> on this topic, but I think I see the virtual as an extension of the real. Um, and maybe this is the virtual understood in I don't know a Deleuzian sense. I think that the virtual is a, a sort of a, a come, comes from the. The, the word virtue, it's a, it's the power um, to to manifest something, so it, it, a power that exists in reality. So, so reality, if something is virtual, it's something that could become real um, given the right emphasis. Uh, and, and and virtual reality is certainly you know a, a real sensory experience. I, I think the fiction, on the other hand, is not real. Something that's fictional is is a specific mode of discourse. That signals itself as um, um, a proposition that's that, that has no truth value, and it does this in various ways. There's a big debate in, in narrative theory as to whether uh, there are um, signposts of fictionality, whether you can uh, write something as fictional by choosing certain verb tenses or certain modes of character identification, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and that that is an ongoing ongoing debate, but it is to distinguish the fictional from the fake. Quite quite certainly, I I, th I think that the fake um, or the simulated is not necessarily the same as the fictional. Uh, it, it registers in a different mode, and it's certainly not the same as say a lie or a hoax, which have an intent to deceive. Fictionality never has an intent to deceive, as I understand it. Uh, it's always designed to signal its own fictionality. In, in, in a way, uh, which again just is, is is quite different from say the, the virtual. I don't know if you agree with that sort of uh, taxonomy, Louise. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, and of course, it's a it's a very you're right. It's a complex question because uh, the virtual. Well, we talk about the real and the virtual, but uh, there are different modalities of. Uh, uh, dissociation from uh, the the reality, and you know, with the augmented reality, uh, the uh, it's um, it's a reflection on uh, uh, a perception or a, a potentiality of the real as well. Um, the the fictional. Um, to me is always more connected to uh, some kind of uh, narrative intent. Uh, and uh, there's a, a creative dimension. Uh, the, the fictional always or most often aims at uh, creating uh, an, an alternate reality or uh, some, uh, some alternate world uh, in the process of uh, uh, creating this, this uh, through this narrative, uh, so uh, I I wouldn't place them in a position either. 
Um, yeah, and I so I, I agree with you. I, and this this is a really interesting question that the fictional always has some kind of narrative intent. Um, this is another a debate. You know, is it possible? Do you need narrative, a story, to have a fiction? Can you have, say, a fictional image? Um, is is a question. And you know, some people say, well, what if I have an an image of uh, an imaginary city? And I would say, well, that's a fictive city, but it's not fictional necessarily. Um, a unicorn is fictive, but it's not fictional until I tell a story about the unicorn. So I would make that that distinction as well. Um, mm -hmm. And this maybe gets into the, your second question, Palabi, about about uh, is it <laughs> do we always want um, this this awareness of the fact that you're in a fiction? Do you always want to distance um, the reader from immersion? I suppose. I, I guess I do simply because that's the kind of fiction I like to read. I like to read, you know, postmodern metafiction and surf fiction that constantly reminds you you're reading a story. Um, mm -hmm. Borges and Calvino and everyone coming out of that. And, and I think that um, I like the foregrounding of artifice. Uh, I also think it's possible, there have been recent studies, um, uh, Alice Bell and Astrid Enslin and others, um, about the, the impossibility of any real immersion. The idea that the idea of being totally transported to a fictional world is an overstatement that we're always sort of uh, pushed into the fictional world, but then popped out again as well by various factors. Um, and so total immersion, and this maybe connects to Louise's total screens as well, is, is a kind of a fiction in itself. Um, and so if, if in a sense, we're constantly, we can't be fully absorbed in the fiction of the artifice, if we're constantly negotiating, you know, the, the uh, apparatus of reading, the situation of reading, even if it's just a paper book that you're holding in an armchair, constantly reminded of that, then maybe the most realistic fiction, the most realistic story I can tell is one that acknowledges that, draws attention to it, and doesn't try to ignore it, right? Um, but uh, that said, I, I also think that because, uh, maybe because I study utopian fiction, I'm uh, very interested in this idea of science fictional estrangement. I'm very interested in worlds that don't make you comfortable, that don't bring you in, that foreground the distance between um, your world and their world, um, show you what's different, and that seems strange to you, at least until you get used to it. And the idea there is that ultimately, you may be estranged from the fictional world at first, but ultimately, once you get used to it, you realize, hey, this is a better place. This is a more ideal world. This is utopia. Why is my own world so lousy? And then the estrangement reflects back on reality. And then you start to see your own world as kind of strange and arbitrary, full of arbitrary conventions that, that don't have to be this way. And again, this, this gets back to that mantra uh, I mentioned of this is the utopian mantra that a, another world is possible. So I, I think maybe, maybe reminding people that <laughs> Not uh, well, maybe uh, reminding them of the apparatus of the story itself is a form of estrangement and, and can raise critical awareness, I hope. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that, that's interesting because, well, in, in the three um, art pieces uh, I, I described, I think that that was um, in a way the objective of each one of them you know, to make us aware of the materiality of the screen, something that we, uh, we forget. You know, we take for granted that we inhabit a similar space because the four of us uh, are presented on the screen with the same background. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but clearly, um, certainly for, for Penelope and Brico, uh, becoming aware uh, of the nature of the screen, this meta-narrative in a way, um, is, uh, is very much present in, in her work in general uh, and, and certainly in that piece. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, I, I presented um, some art pieces rather than uh, narrative-based uh, work uh, because that's also closely connected to the work I, I do these days. Uh, but, um, but yes, uh, 
creating uh, this uh, moment of uh, suspended reality where you're willing to accept uh, whatever the author wants to tell you or whichever path he wants to take you through uh, is, uh, is a sign of great fiction, you know, uh, because uh, we're willing to accept virtually anything from, uh, from the author when, when the, the characters are compelling and, and the, the story is relevant. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. And this is where the ethics come into it. I mean, some of these ideas of sort of narrative transportation and immersion are being you know, hot, very closely studied by, by marketers, for instance, because they realize this. And one of the theories is, you know, why is transportation to the world of the story so important? Why do advertisers want to take you into this world, even if it's in a brief commercial? And, and one of the theories is that it takes so much mental effort to construct a, a mental model, a conceptual model of the imaginary world that you're in, which you're, you're, you're being told what's in the world, especially if it's written in language, you're being told what's in the world, who's there, where, how they're related, where they're moving. And you have to keep all of this together and put together these spatio-temporal models. Um, it takes so much cognitive overhead to do that, that you sacrifice some of your critical awareness in order to do it. Um, your own critic, you, you just don't have enough mental energy left to be cr fully critical. So we tend to believe what's going on in the story. And again, that can be really powerful if you're an artist trying to tell an, a story, but, but it also can be dangerous <laughs> depending on what kind of story you're trying to tell. Um, I don't, sorry, I'm just going to interject here because I want to make sure we cover some of the questions in the chat. And one of them I feel relates um, a lot to what you're already talking about. So I'm going to go out of order and say the last question, um, which is from Sojung, which is um, it's for both of you. And I wonder if you find tensions between immersive engagement and critical awareness in digital virtual storytelling, or do you think virtual immersion could elicit another level of awareness about real? Mm. I mean, I, th I think that's the goal, So Young. I think that I think this is exactly it. There is definitely that tension, but it, it's it's a it's a productive tension. And I, I think if depending on how it's handled and how the reader responds, which you can never fully predict, or the audience, the viewer, in the case of uh, visual art, um, I, I I do think that that uh, it, it can create. Um, uh, some kind of awareness over over uh, at, at a different level. If if what you mean is can full virtual immersion in like a, in a virtual reality be critical? Well, uh, yeah, I think so too. I've certainly seen some you know games for Oculus that are working in that function. A lot of them too do try to foreground the apparatus or virtually simulate the the apparatus or even the room that you're in as as you're exploring it. Um, so. So I think that that's, there are some really clever tricks and, and um, conventions that are emerging in VR um, to, to, to make it a more um, critical um, and thought provoking medium. But we're just at the early days really. Yeah. Um, yes, and it's, um, it's an interesting question. Uh, this exhibition I, I talked about, Total Screen, uh, was also uh, documented for VR. Uh, with the Oculus, uh, <laughs> we, because we we worked with uh, some some colleagues who wanted to experiment for the exhibition, and uh, and given the fact that uh, we could open the exhibition to a very limited number of people because of the pandemic, um, we we decided to explore that side of it. Uh, could we document uh, virtually this exhibition that challenges uh, the, the question of the, the virtual? And, and um, I think this kind of immersive technology uh, aims very often in closing the gap. You know, you, you become, um, uh, it's very hard to, be, to remain aware of the outside world when you put on these uh, 
goggle, uh, it's very destabilizing and might be a gen generational thing, but <laughs> I get nauseous every time. Uh, so, uh, so I think the intention is quite different with uh, this virtual uh, immersion uh, that, uh, that blocks you off in a way from, from the outside world. Um, there are other forms of immersion uh, that uh, maintain uh, this distinction between the two. And I think Brian's, the projects that you, you talked about uh, certainly do that uh, to some extent. And uh, to me, one of the, one of the most e effective uh, artwork in, in uh, that matter is, is the work of Janet Cardiff. And she was one of the first uh, to experiment with this form of immersion, but rather than being purely visual, it's auditive. You know, it, it, it's, uh, she, she created um, these paths through New York. You know, uh, one that was very effective is uh, her long black hair. Uh, and, and in fact, it started from, uh, from uh, the gallery and you had to put this huge cask that uh, created a 3D sound. Uh, and the story was told uh, and you had, you had to go through the park and, and, uh, and the story um, integrated uh, the the experience of the city itself. And, you know, if you saw someone sitting on the bench in question, suddenly this coincidence uh, became uh, relevant all of a sudden. Uh, so, um, so I think the, um, uh, some of these immersive uh, technology can maintain uh, this distance, this tension between the two. And, and that's certainly the intention of uh, most works of art, you know, to bring you elsewhere uh, and not only tell you what you should expect, but uh, let your own interpretation uh, uh, play a part in, in the creative process, like, like in any uh, good fiction. <laughs> Absolutely. And we've learned a lot about the importance of audio you know, over our various experiments and stories. Yeah. Um, audio is incredibly immersive. I mean, this is why Bell at Ali even add the category of audio immersion to spatio-temporal immersion and character immersion and all those other forms. Um, for digital um, texts in particular, audio immersion emerge, emerges as really, really important. I was thinking about, you were talking about the Oculus and the first time I experienced Oculus is, it was a student who, who um, was working on um, the Disney archives and it was an amazing pro project and had a, uh, founded a 3D rendering of the early Disney world from the mid century. And we tried it on an Oculus in the lab and it was amazing because you saw Disney with the early exhibits and the early pavilions without Epcot and everything and without any people either, because those are really hard to render in VR. And so it was just buildings and space, empty spaces. It was like, I don't know, Dekirico or something. It was just big empty sites. And I started to realize, wow, without all the other people around, Disney's really boring. In fact, I think that the main attraction at Disney World is the other people right? It's for people watching. And they start to think about, you know, what Disney has become. And there, there weren't in this version any shops you could buy anything at or any ticket booths or anything. So that also made you think about, you know, the if you strip it of all of the commercial uh, trappings, what do you have left at Disney? And um, it was pretty interesting, I think. And Baudrillard, of course, has written a lot about Disney <laughs> as a kind of epitome of America. But um mm -hmm. But yeah, what, what I loved about you're talking, the screens that you, you showed, Louise, this idea of, you know, taking the LCD screen and breaking it down, though, like, this is the thing about Disney, I realized, what has Disney become? And what if we took it back, we did an archaeology of that? And I love that these artists are doing these media archaeologies of, of the screen itself. 
and showing the screen in its material composition and in its various layers of screens um, that it has. And that to me is really important because that kind of that kind of archaeology takes you back and it reminds you that you know this we're always on this constant upgrade path where we have to get the next best iPhone and we have to get the next best computer and the next Oculus and so on. And this, this archaeology, I think by, by just disrupting, looking really hard at, at the technology we already have, realizing that we don't even understand fully how it works and how well it works and taking us back, I think it disrupts that upgrade path and that constant compulsion toward technological progress. I think that that's a really valuable message of, of some of the pieces that you showed. Yeah. Yeah, and in the same exhibition, uh, there were other pieces um, that, uh, well, many of the artists are very fascinated with this moment of transition. You know, in 2004, when Flickr suddenly became the platform on which you could put all your photographs, sometimes very intimate stuff. Uh, and uh, there was this absence of awareness of the others and the gaze of the others. And, and so there are all these artists now uh, exploring this digital archive of personal moment. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, I, I think that's one of the big challenge with technology. We, uh, we get involved, we get excited by, by the new toy uh, and we sometimes forget the implication uh, of, of the technology and, and we're all this information that we upload uh, on the net uh, might end up one day. <laughs> I, I love that idea of using social media as the subject of your art <laughs> and putting one more layer of representation on it. It's brilliant. It reminded me, uh, some years back, we invited a California artist called Jenny Odell up to give a talk. And she, she did these fantastic, um, it was a, it was a art book at the time, which was a tour that she took of America and showing all the different spots as she rode, you know, route 66 and drove around to different sites. And, and but it, it, she didn't actually go anywhere. She just used images from Google maps and kind of Photoshopped her image in the rear view mirror of her car over top of it. So it looked or herself standing, you know, at the edge of the grand Canyon and so on. And it was, it was really amazing because she talked knowledgeably about all the sites she went to, how much at night it was for a room and, you know, which roads were better and so on. But that was all just taken from the data on um, a TripAdvisor and, and, and so forth. And she also acknowledged, this gets back to this question about, Sojin's question about, you know, critical awareness and, and immersion. She, she acknowledged that she was faking it at various points. It was really obvious that she wasn't actually there. So it was a really interesting sort of donning the mask and, 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 and embodying this sort of um, fully immersively embodying the story world and then distancing herself from it at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I love that idea that there's so much of an archive out there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and, and Google Map, but also uh, Google Street View yeah. Uh, Mishka yeah. Ener was one of the uh, early artists to explore the potential of Google Street View. Uh, he, he spent hours, weeks, months, years scanning Google Street View for the shot of this weird scene, you know, uh, someone lying on the ground, uh, uh, some prostitute at the crossroad in the middle of nowhere waiting for someone to pick her up. And, and he printed those, you know, huge images. And, and again, raising the question of, uh, of authorship uh, because uh, this data is there, uh, it exists. And uh, is the author the one who takes the image or the one who frames it and uh, reinterprets it in a way. Uh, so. and, and this reminds me again of your Basanta example, this, uh, you know, what if the author is a computer or an AI or an algorithm? You know, can you have art as algorithm only? Um, I, I love that idea uh, of the, it, it, there's, there's something strange about this. It's a kind of a bachelor machine that's producing these images nonstop. And again, you know, emptying out the human subject 
um, is somehow always going to be threatening at the same time as it is this kind of fantasy of automatism. Um, it's it's a highly uncanny and yet um, and yet so compelling. It's hard to take your eyes away from from these scans as it just continues to churn out artwork. I found, and they're beautiful. Some of them are just amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think there are a few questions that we are getting in the yeah. chat. If you can uh, see those, so um, I'll. It, some of them are in line with what we are talking about. So I'll take them as they've come in, uh, and we have. A question from Elora Berman, and she asks uh, Brian if it is possible to create or upload stories from other languages in Storytech. Uh, sure, the the text authoring interface that we use um, uses a Unicode version, so um, it does allow for international character sets. Not every international character set. Um, so some languages it would allow, um, but we also, because we allow rich media assets, such as audiovisual, you can record something in, uh, in, in any language and upload that. Uh, and that would be triggered when somebody enters the proper zone, for instance. And once they do, of course, they could, you know, that could leave other zones to be discovered, or it could um, level the person up to an entirely new playing field with different zones, um, depending on what they triggered. So this is how you can construct various story paths and, and reward certain behaviors and discourage others. <clears throat> thank you, Brian. Um, and we do have Claudio Scarby here. Claudio, thank you for being here. And uh, um, he's got some fascinating comments and questions in the chat, which I'll read it out to you. And he says, it's easy to take for granted that the screen is there and the subject is separated from it. What happens when the boundary between the screen and the subject is broken? The condition of breaking the fourth wall. I have in mind, for example, the Truman Show and the contemporary technological advancement in virtual eyes, not just virtual glasses. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just gonna read a couple of other things that he's written, or do you want me to go one by one? Because Claudio's ideas are always very, very complex. And <laughs> so, okay, let me read the rest of it. And he says, very interesting, the idea suggested by Luis of creating a screening as, sorry, of screening as violation. I think about Vesalius' necessity of dead victims in order to violate the boundary between the self and the gaze. Are, are we learning to think the site as a screen in the same way as we learned to think about viewing as perspectival constructs? Some very challenging uh, <laughs> comments. Um, maybe starting with the first one, uh, we take for granted that the screen uh, is there uh, and um, well, to me, it raises the whole question of surveillance as well. Uh, are we always aware that the screen is there? Um, it's, uh, and and, and uh, that's what some of the artists like, like Misha, Mishka Ener and Vazambati started from, uh, this kind of objective gaze of the surveillance camera. Uh, and and uh, um, so through the process of selection, uh, putting the emphasis on, on, on breaking the bar barrier in a way uh, through the emotional engagement that these dramatic if, uh, events uh, create. Um, but um, at the same time, uh, it also raises the, uh, the issue of the, the current or the recent uh, situation and our recent engagement with screen. I mean, the fact that we can have uh, this kind of talk uh, on Zoom um, would have been uh, unthinkable two years ago. Uh, and now uh, it's something that we do take for granted, but, but I think it's, it's quite recent. Uh, and it certainly has changed um, the way we relate to, to each other, uh, this constant awareness of ourselves. Like uh, I always try to put my screen as far back <laughs> as, as I can because I find it 
intensely disturbing to see myself all the time. Uh, so um, I, I think we're, we're facing a rather um, new phenomena uh, with this omnipresence of, of the screen. Um, it has also changed the way we, um, we interact. Um, the, uh, the chat on the side, you know, with, with questions, uh, it's also something that has been introduced. Uh, I mean, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, like, like many of you, I'm sure, uh, I had to learn how to teach via Zoom. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and I tend to uh, well, there's this one course I teach where I have like anywhere between 150 and 180 people, uh, and um, and strangely enough, the fact of teaching uh, in front of the screen uh, has creating uh, created a completely different dynamics. Um, very few students are comfortable raising their hand in a class of 180 students. Uh, but with the chat, uh, it became something else uh, altogether and uh, something that was surprising, you know. I, uh, I discovered the, the power of this parallel discourse uh, in, uh, on the side. So um, it's, uh, yes, we are aware of the, the screen uh, that is there, but um, but I think our relationship to it is is evolving, is changing, and certainly uh, in the past two years, uh, we've flipped the thing around completely, uh, and uh, and I see it as a potential. Uh, uh, I I don't have a definite answer to or definite uh, response uh, to uh, to Claudio's comments, but. Uh, but certainly our condition uh, has changed and it's still evolving uh, in relation to that. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And the other back channels and different media and apps that students are using constantly too, um, to, which you know, is great in a sense because they're engaging with their classmates through all kinds of different back channels that we never see. And this this reminds me too of you know what what um, J. David Bolter and Richard Grusin famously talked about in in their study of remediation of reusing old media in new formats, and they say if you think about something like a news channel to your average news channel on television today, and what you see is you see you know the the newscaster speaking, but then you also see an image of um, what's going on in real time from their camera. And then you have the Chiron running across the screen with updates of something, maybe a stock ticker below that, and maybe um, an ad for what's coming on next on the news channel will pop up in the corner, right? So there's constantly not just one screen, but multiple screens being from multiple different media, be sometimes analog media too, being remediated in the form of this one presentation. And the paradox is that in multiplying the screens in this way, the goal is to create a sense of immediacy, um, not of hypermediacy. So the goal is to somehow make you feel like you're there in the action happening while it's happening in real time. But it's only through hypermediation that this is achieved. And, and this is why I'm not sure that we're gaining a lot more screen media literacy. In, in, in some ways we are, but in other ways, I'm not sure that we're we really see the screens as somehow more artificial. Um, I, I think that in some ways we're just, we become used to these screens and we expect to see them and we almost see them as a kind of a transparent view in many ways, which is the why the, the art that, that you showed, Louise, is so important to remind us that that's not it. Um, as for the, the question of the virtual eyes, I, I guess, you know, when I think about this, are we getting better at this? I, I don't know. Um, I Isabel Peterson from the UOIT has done uh, some studies of these, these virtual augmented reality contact lenses that they're building now, um, and uh, which is like, I guess, Oculus, but, <laughs> or maybe StoryTrek, but without, without the heavy apparatus. 
And she, she shows that, you know, really the expectations for these technologies, that, well, it's all driven by anticipations in popular media, in um, tech magazines, in um, comic books and science fiction that have been going on for years. So the technologies that we get and the way we see and use those technologies have already been shaped by fictional representations for many, many years before we even see the technologies realized. And I think for that reason, I, I don't know that we're necessarily getting better. Again, I, I would push back against that narrative of progress. And I would say that, that possibly we're, we're just getting locked into more <laughs> ideological expectations that surround these technologies, um, which is why it's constantly you know, necessary to break these screens apart, as Louise has shown us, and to, and to show us the constituent parts and to show us when they break down when technology fails is, is really important to show. And that's something the marketers will never show you. <laughs> I just wanted to um, interrupt and, and read the last question that's in the chat to make sure that we have time to cover them all. Um, and this one's by Giovanni. Um, and it's um, the discourse as narrative as one, hold on, I'm gonna start that over. The discourse as narrative as one which can be enriched by digital technologies is generative. It allows us to be transported to other worlds and new stories. But what about those other stories? That is those that are nested within our own narratives. Motivation, motivating my observation in the work of the American uh, psychologist, Jerome Bruner, who observes how life is led at, life as led is inseparable from life as told. How can personal stories which follow Bruner as key to meaning making be enriched or translated or transformed through the virtual or the terrain of the screen. Alternatively, in, is the crossing onto the terrain of the frame, even when human presence is eliminated as in the scanner project, a paradoxical one. This is, that is, it inspires towards the expression of personal narrative, which is not present, but emergent. Um, so I think another uh, question to, and, and statement that really makes you have to think maybe on a response, but um, uh, Louise, do you have a, an immediate thought to that? Well, uh, uh, again, it, it's a very complex uh, question, but if I understand it well, um, the, the objective of uh, some of the works I showed, and certainly uh, the work by Basenta with the, the scanner and the printer, um, is, uh, is designed to challenge our preconception and um, to show the, the ultimate um, consequence of um, uh, mechanization in a way or uh, removing the individual from from the process to show us uh, the a work of art produced without uh, the uh, the intervention of an, an author where the personal story uh, gets in, involved or, or or incorporated is through um, our own reaction to it, uh, because it's a very, uh, it's a, many of these works that we presented are very challenging uh, in uh, their very intention, you know, to make us aware of either the presence of screen and materiality of screen or the, the, the place of the author, the creator in the process. Uh, and, um, and by showing us some extreme conclusion to a certain process, um, we as a spectator, as a, uh, we, we react to it uh, and, and uh, we can take a position in relation to that. Uh, and, and I think that it's, it's in that way that the, the personal story is incorporated in a way. Um, so, um, I guess in, in, in terms of, uh, of the fictional world, um, the, the personal story also uh, becomes involved in the way one interprets a story. Because as I mentioned earlier, the, the author 
gives us some kind of a framework of a story, uh, uh, fleshes out some, some characters, but in the end, uh, we will relate to them in different ways depending on uh, our personal story. So, um, so I, I don't know if it answers the question, but it's uh, an approximation of an answer maybe. Yeah, I would pick up on that. I would say absolutely. I think that character identification, as you have said, is really, really important for stimulating a, a reader response, and which is going to be different for everyone, of course. Um, the, the most popular texts, this is your popular cultural theorists say the most popular texts are those that offer all kinds of different character identifications um, for people from, from different subject identities will be able to to uh, identify with different characters, depending, we, they're all constrained by the same system. The fact that we all live, you know, within um, a, a late capitalism, for instance, um, that's what that's what makes popular texts popular. Though the idea that we can find somebody who um, somehow navigates this world we live in and identify with their struggles, and it may not always be the protagonist of the story either. It could be a side character, a minor character um, that you want to champion. Uh, as, as this question of emergent um, um, uh, identity and, and meaning, Giovanni, I think is really important because I, I know for, for our story tracks, at least, it, the meaning is always emergent. The story doesn't exist until you start moving and you have to move around. And again, as, I, as I've said, you have to find, uh, or I, I don't know if you have to, but I, th I don't think readers can help but find um, significance in their own real environment that somehow speaks to, reflects, or um, accentuates the meaning within the represented story. That's going to be different for everybody. Everyone's going to move a little bit differently, take a different path. Everyone's going to notice different things in their real world at different times. So the text is never even exactly the same in the stories that we give. It's always going to produce a kind of a different personal um, interaction with, with the trek that we, that we offer. Uh, I'm not saying it's an infinite, uh, um, I mean, context is infinite. Perhaps the meanings are more constrained uh, by the story that we, that we do record and that we do um, try to convey. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see, though, the extent to which, um, I, I don't know yet whether we haven't done any kind of uh, formal reader response experiments to figure out how uh, our users interpret the stories they read in relation to their own values, their own interests, their own life stories. That, that would be a really interesting experiment to run though. So thank, I'll have to think about that. Thank you for that. I, on that, I, I was thinking uh, the nature of the projects that you showed both of you, um, some of them were more demonstrative or experiential while um, some were a critique like Louis, the three projects that you showed us, they were critiques. Um, did, is that a, a fair reading um, of, or Brian, do you, and both of you, how do you feel about the nature of the projects that you showed today and um, whether they were critiquing the, the, the place of the digital, um, presenting it, documenting it, what were they doing? Well, uh, if I if I can speak for myself, the the projects I presented um, aimed at making the viewer, the spectator, aware of the nature of the screen, um, uh, and and in in all cases, a, a kind of fascination for the. Uh, the untapped potential or the, the unsaid, the, the things that we don't see, like, like with Umbrico's screen, the, the reflections we don't see, the, the error signal that we, can, we try to get rid of whenever it happens on our screen. Uh, but it's this uh, harvesting of these, um, these unusual moments. Um, Implicitly, of course, there's a, the, the fact that it was grounded in some kind of response to uh, Baudrillard's uh, writing. Um, it's, it's, an, 
I, I think in in, uh, in their own ways, each project uh, attempted to respond to this omnipresence of screen that, that Baudrillard uh, diagnosed already three decades ago. Um, so, um, so yes, it, you can call it a, a, a critic, uh, but it's also, it's also a testing of the limit and the potential uh, of the screens, uh, rather than, than a simple rejection of, uh, of the situation we're in. And, and in some way, that's also what I perceived in, in Brian's project. You know, how can we um, subvert the screens, the, the tools, the Google map, the, uh, all these tools that we have and that tell us that to go from point A to point B, you have to follow this path. Uh, what if this path becomes something else? Uh, and and uh, so it raises all sorts of possibilities. Uh, so uh, I think one can still be positive while thinking about this omnipresence of screens. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. As a utopian, I have to. I see that <laughs> we constantly critique technology, but we also see that it's attractive. It has potential to make people realize um, that a better world is possible. So there's something about te the technological novums, in fact, these technological innovations that, that carry with them dreams and imaginings of, of a better place. And we try to capture that. I want to think back about the specific projects that I talked about today. So, you know, Isolation U, the student's zombie um, game, certainly that's a critique of, of um, media capitalism, but it's all in surveillance capitalism. Uh, but it's also, you know, the, the devices at some point in the game offer you a, 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 a connection into an underground resistance movement among students who are fighting back against the zombie virus. So it's a way to create community if you go to the right places on campus. Um, likewise, when I think about <clears throat> the Hemingway project, it's a bit more challenging because of course, Hemingway didn't have a mobile phone as far as I know. And, um, you know, but it, it, what it does foreground, I mean, you play the role of a paparazzi, basically. You're chasing him around and you realize, well, you know, media surveillance is nothing new. It forces you to think about the long durée of this, of these, this desire to know more about celebrity culture, to know more about influencers and how that connects maybe with the devices <clears throat> that we have today. Um, the Rankin Project is, is a bit different because that's not our original story. And it's the story itself, because it's a detective fiction, it's interesting. And again, it was written, you know, 20 years ago, but over 20 years ago, but it has in the story itself, it doesn't have um, uh, any real telephone connections, right? And it's funny because I think that there was, there was a point at which, you know, I think that Rebus has to go in one of the books, he has to go find a phone booth, which is like the last phone booth in Edinburgh. Um, and this is the problem with, with uh, detective fiction in general is that you can't give everybody a cell phone because suddenly, or it makes it really challenging because suddenly um, then a lot of secrets come to light. Then there's not a lot of mystery. Then you know who the killer is right away and you can call the police right away. These kinds of instant connectivity that we have change the game of murder mysteries quite a bit. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a problem really that the wire tried to address in some ways. What is interesting about, about the rank in fiction is that it constantly draws connections between, um, Scotland, Edinburgh in Scotland and the broader world of geopolitics. So you're always involved in the story in these broader trends, these, these larger international and transnational trends. Um, and I think that, I hope that by using our app to, to hear the story, to experience the story, you, you're realizing constantly that you're in, you're embedded already in global positioning satellite networks. And because you're part of these, these global networks, um, I think it feeds the, the, the sense of being surveilled while you're hearing the story, feeds into those moments where the story gestures towards the broader, the broader global uh, situation of Rebus and his prey. <laughs> Thank you, a very fascinating couple of hours and uh, very interesting uh, questions from the audience. So thank you all in the audience uh, for 
putting in those wonderful comments and questions. And I think we all now need to take a break from the screen <laughs> and yes. probably go out and enjoy um, a wonderful day, at least here in Ottawa. Um, it's, it's, I hope it's not raining. I mean, I've been looking at my screen. I haven't looked out of my window. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on that note, I would uh, and probably wrap up and close the session. But before that, Louise and Brian, if you have any closing comments, uh, please go ahead. Oh, just thank you. Thank you both for this opportunity. And thank you to everyone who was here today. They're fantastic questions. It was a really great discussion. And I hope that, that we can continue it going forward. And uh, I completely agree. It was, it was a very interesting conversation. Uh, I will certainly uh, look up your project, Brian's. It was very, very fascinating. And, uh, and thank you for the question. Uh, it's uh, it was uh, some of them challenging, but a uh, very important question. Thank you. And I just wanted to also remind that we'll be coming back. We are taking a break for Canada Day uh, this week, so we won't be back next week with a webinar. No, no we are back next week. Isn't it on July 7th? That's next week. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, July 7th. Uh, we, we'll meet again. Uh, the title of our next webinar is Absences and Pluralities of Stories mm -hmm. with Mark Nuvu and Zoe Todd in conversation. So please log in uh, for that one. And uh, we hope to uh, further this conversation. But also thank you, Luis and Brian. Yes, uh, thank you. Our, our video will be available on our YouTube channel. So um, for later viewing. And we also hope to uh, put together a journal publication in, in the future. So we'll be in uh, touch with both of you regarding that. Yes. Thank you. Do you want to say something? Um, I mean, it just echoes the same thing. Thank you very much. It's been a very, um, very thoughtful conversations. And um, I have multiple sticky notes filled with notes and information. Um, and uh, it was really great to have you here. So thank you. And I look forward to hearing more later. So have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Okay. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.